Yeah, very good. Good morning. I think uh, wonderful session, Priya. Uh, for sure, tomorrow's identity or so-called Aadhaar, the one which we carry uh, as a card or uh, our data, which is in a centralized data database. And the way I keep hearing, Aadhaar is also going to come on blockchain. For sure, future of uh, KYC or uh, uh, know your uh, KYC is going to be uh, decentralized. A lot of tries are happening worldwide. And for sure, India also looking forward how uh, blockchain can be uh, really utilized. Mm -hmm. DigiLocker is, uh, uh, is coming on blockchain. Uh, DG Yatra, we have seen how adoption is happening. There are a lot of industries has adopted blockchain. I, if I go back in 2014-15, uh, personally when I started writing a blog around blockchain, uh, I think uh, that moment hardly three, four blogs used to get published on LinkedIn and so on. Today, I think every hour or every uh, minute you will see something or other thing comes and see the adoption, is huge adoption globally, which we have seen. Uh, countries like Estonia are those templates for a blockchain implementation, Dubai or Australia. Almost 10 plus countries have announced their national strategies, not only announcement, they have done a lot of work. South Korea, uh, complete transportation on a, on a, on a blockchain side. Uh, India is also not there. Uh, India has announced the first national strategy document back in 2018. Uh, there are a lot of other entities, NPCI, IDRBT uh, started working on those blockchain. Recently, we have seen how central bank digital currency, uh, India's uh, e-rupee, which is a, a, a digital currency of India, is going to be on a blockchain kind of a ecosystem. A lot of things are happening and what we have seen, enterprise blockchain typically, which is uh, private to all those enterprises, so-called banks, insurance, healthcare, governments uh, primarily, a uh, lot of huge adoption and if you see the adoption uh, curve on multiple areas starting with uh, support of a government, yes it is there, support of a corporate, we have seen the journeys of Wipro's or TCS's, Infosys, how they have started adopting blockchain back in six, seven, eight years. Companies like Oracle not in blockchain now, they are almost uh, uh, sparing, sparing the blockchain exercises. Various protocols, look at uh, seven years before how Ethereum was there and today we are talking around various tokenization uh, uh, platforms or protocols on Ethereum, Hyperledger, uh, at least we can name 40 plus platforms wherein five plus platforms are always on mainstream doing with lot of use cases. Apart from governments, corporates, companies, academia is also now coming up with a lot of courses, right? We have seen many courses, colleges have announced MBAs or engineering into blockchains and so far. Uh, I think we'll understand from our uh, panel uh, speakers what is this enterprise blockchain all about and while we talk about what are those challenges and uh, what are their personal experiences while picking up those threads, uh, what's really needed to really say that internet is a backbone for every other use case but there are a lot of challenges with the internet. What we have seen largely last 20-25 years, trust, which is a gap which we see always say blockchain will come and really resolve that uh, problem of our trust and most of the ecosystem what we see today which is a uh, web 2 or so called uh, client server model, tomorrow it is going to be marketplace and we see there are at least seven to eight marketplaces uh, backed by Ola's or backed by uh, some of those food ecosystems. Uh, so study says that uh, over a period of last next five, six years, at least 300 plus entities will come on the marketplace and when those entities will come, automatically we need that trust. So inherently we will not talk about blockchain then, what we will talk about every use case backed by trust layer and many other, uh, other technologies. So we'll open up this floor with all of our expert panel. I'll start with Rama. Uh, Rama, if you can introduce yourself and uh, come up with that experience. Like you have seen that large scale experience, how government has picked up, how GMR has picked up the, some of the use case. It's not only talking about blockchain, but you guys have really implemented that. Maybe what was that journey in a brief and what challenges you have seen and how really embarked that journey. And, and it is becoming a backbone or an example for other industries. So how do we really adopt blockchain? Yeah. Sure. Um, Good to be back here. Met a lot of friends from the whole blockchain crypto space. Um, good to be here in Bangalore. So I think from a corporate standpoint, we at GMR, obviously, uh, we are a large infrastructure company priming some of the largest airports in the country and outside. I think we are a classical case of a multi-stakeholder environment where we are an orchestrator. There is obviously the airports, the airline, the CISF, the multiple concessionaires. Uh, all of the people who provide bunch of services for all the passengers that move through. And there is myriad people and actors. So anywhere where there is different people and actors and you want to, and there is no inherent trust, 
and I think uh, Priya had a nice diagram kind of illustrating how identity and SSI, it's just unfortunate SSI hasn't seen the day of light like everybody else using. We have been talking about it from 2016 on. Um, but we believe that there is a lot of natural use cases where blockchain is an easy doubt tail. I think the, the problem with the industry also has been we try to force fit blockchain where probably it's not needed. Uh, but there are definite areas for enterprises, uh, we won for sure. And we have a blockchain center of excellence, so that's the first emerging tech that we kick-started. Uh, Prasanna has been helping us uh, on that as well. Where we are setting up a full a BAS layer, uh, blockchain as a service platform. And we have at least half a dozen dApps that we have identified that we're working with partners to co-build. Um, obviously, uh, being an enterprise, we are kind of picking up either like, you know, an, an R3 or an Hyperledger, uh, just kind of being on the private permission side. But I think we're looking for bridges to see how a private to public can also happen for things to harness, whether it is data, collaboration, and stuff like that. Um, beyond airports, cargo is another large thing where there is freight movement, there is a lot of baggage movements and stuff where there is so many different parties. So I think those are easier ones for industry to really latch on and uh, showcase the power of what blockchain has to bring in from a decentralized standpoint. And we are full throttle on it, and I think you will get to see more and more of that. Uh, we have kick-started, so it's a work in progress. I think it's a positive thing. Excellent, so I think uh, uh, enterprise blockchain or blockchain is now more like a, at an essence stage, the way research is happening. And largely what we have seen, uh, too much of adoption we have seen, at least POC's pilots we have seen so many. Uh, Telangana government uh, uh, was aiming for a blockchain district, for sure we'll pick up that trend and we'll see how that becomes a very good example for other states to follow. Uh, Andhra government tried, uh, Maharashtra government is there, they have implemented many more uses like certificates and so on with the help of Polygon. I mean that happened after my Korea visit when yeah. I was representing India when we were doing the first hybrid chain. Then I came back and I was telling uh, KTRG that we should have a blockchain district. People are having blockchain beaches, blockchain alley and whatnot. And we started the blockchain district but I think unfortunately that's the time when the regulation was kind of going up and down and there was a whole bunch of things happening with like, you know, all the altcoins, so to say, right? Leaving the BTC and ETH alone. So I think with so much vagarity that is happening and lot of the use cases which are gray, I think we got kind of, um, I think all the good use cases also got kind of painted in that. But I think we should pick it back again. Ah, so I think uh, it's picking up many more use cases. It's not only government and uh, corporate use cases. Uh, 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 Tamil Nadu government tried for e-voting. So sometimes I feel blockchain is not a challenge. It's all about mindset. How do you really make them understand this is something need of a future? You understand it or there is a millennials are going to make us understand the, the way they are building new ecosystem, right? And primarily, if you see globally, the adoption of a blockchain typically on finance sector is huge, followed by insurance or media and entertainment. We have our friend from Netflix. So, Hitesh, uh, we have seen journey together, right? And how ICCI, SBI and uh, many other banks came in together uh, 2017 Feb. I still remember that meeting in uh, SBI. Uh, and after that, it went for one year together to clear up those mindset. 36 members on bank chain. It was a wonderful experience and we picked up the thread from there and you made it happen for at least 15 plus banks to invest on a blockchain site, EBIC. That's a one of the story and we look forward how your guidance will really help and the banking industry, how it can become an example for many other sectors. So Hitesh, how was your experience so far and how you really look forward, which are those prominent use cases banks should really adopt? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> you've seen this journey from early days, right, along with us. Uh, one of the major constraint when we embarked on this journey was to explain, you know, about the blockchain and uh, there were a lot of myths associated, right? I mean, many times we used to kind of get, you know, arguments or comments like blockchain is a, a technology, it's a solution which is finding its own problem to solve, right? I mean, and many times it was associated with, you know, crypto. So it took a lot of time to convince, you know, banks that, uh, DLT, you know, has a lot of inherent advantages and this is not a bilateral game. Uh, you know, it needs many more stakeholders to come together and that's where we started, uh, you know, uh, convincing the uh, banks to come and, you know, form a 
joint consortium where all of us can experiment together, right? I mean, rather than uh, spending money individually and going nowhere, it makes sense to come together and, you know, uh, experiment it jointly. And that's where we started this journey. Uh, and uh, while we embarked on this journey, uh, the obvious, you know, question was, what are the problems it can solve for, right? And we discussed many use cases, right, like whether it is KYC, whether loan syndication, or it can be treasury operations, or trade finance, remittance, you know. And then ultimately, we figured out that uh, everybody felt trade finance is the most apt use case. Uh, and as we know, all know, right, trade finance is very cumbersome, it's paper intensive, it's prone to frauds, and uh, that's where everybody jumped on it and kind of, it is a lot of inefficiencies, right? So if you can solve for this and uh, it, it can bring in many more advantages to banks, to the end customers. And we started envisaging that what do we build around to solve the, you know, problems in trade finance. So then came an idea of building a, you know, a, a ecosystem, right? Trade finance uh, ecosystem, self-fulfilling eco ecosystem for trade finance where you have all the parties which are buyer, seller, exporter, importer, insurance companies, freight forwarding, you know, agents, shipping lines, uh, you know, uh, banks, uh, all of them if they come on the single platform and uh, can we address, you know, some of the inherent challenges like today if you want to, uh, you know, discount a bill, it takes, let's say, anywhere between four to six days, you know, can we do it in, let's say, you know, in the same day or, even if, you know, opening LCs might take sometimes two days, three days, you know, can we do it in four hours? So those were the, you know, outcomes which, you know, we kind of expected that by, you know, creating this ecosystem. And uh, why, you know, DLT, why, you know, it, it became imperative to use DLT for, you know, uh, creating this ecosystem. It's, it's, it's only, you know, that all the parties which are involved are very different, you know, sets of parties with different sets of functions they do, right? So, one important aspect was to make uh, information available to each one of the stakeholders, but only those set of information which is relevant to all the stakeholders, right? The, it, it, which, which needs to uh, kind of uh, uh, give, given to those stakeholders to fulfill their role. And that's where, you know, we, we thought that DLT and then also to bring in trust, right? Authentication, trust. And that's where we thought DLT would be the right technology to, you know, to make it an underlying technology for this platform. And that's where we went about, uh, you know, using DLT framework. Uh, so today as we speak, we have now 18 banks in this consortium and uh, it's a separate entity, for-profit private limited company owned by, you know, 18 banks. And the, uh, the platform is kind of now up for commercial production, uh, you know, uh, we're kind of opening up it uh, for the other banks also to join as members on this, you know, platform. Uh, the first use case obviously is the trade finance, but as we move forward, I think, you know, we want to do many more use cases, right? I mean, uh, a CVDC is one which probably, you know, uh, 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 which will again change the, you know, paradigm, the way we handle money, right? I think uh, you'll be able to program money for yes. specific use purposes and stuff, right? So that's another use case which we feel can be taken. And there are a lot many other, uh, you know, common use cases for the banks which can be taken up on this platform. But it's an exciting journey. It went through uh, a very, uh, uh, no, a roller coaster ride, I mean, you know, getting different banks on the same platform, convincing them to work on the single, you know, kind of protocol, single agenda, agree to the, you know, rules of the consortium. So, uh, it took a while, but after, you know, people understood it, I think, you know, we got humongous cooperation from all the stakeholders. And uh, it would be kind of one of the unique kind of, you know, platform, uh, uh, you know, coming out of India and probably for the world. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think the way we have seen the rise of NPCI, right, back in, and how NPCI really created multiple uh, payment products, starting with IMPS, NFS system, like interoperable ATMs, UPA is a landscape, BBPS, and so many. I think we'll look at how IBIC will really transform the banking the way we see. I was sitting in a bank for 10 plus years. I have seen at least there are 60 plus prominent use cases where we can save a lot of INRs. Like opening account, 
and the same customer has to go to another bank and redo the KYC, we can always create a decentralized KYC. So that we can say oh, INRC. It takes at least 5,000 to 7,000 rupees to open a bank account. And we never know whether that customer is going to be a primary uh, customer or not. So I think that could be the one use case. I think IDRBT along with Miti and some 11 banks are trying. I think uh, RBA Innovation Hub is uh, spearheading some of those exercises, pilots they have done with the three plus startups uh, last year. I think we should see a lot of use cases coming from uh, banking. I think what you sp spoke about ecosystem is not a problem of uh, one bank, but uh, the blockchain will prevail if you have a ecosystem led uh, use cases out there, right? Uh, we have our friend uh, uh, wedding uh, from Netflix. Uh, so uh, we have seen blockbuster story, right? How blockbuster was one of those prominent model back in uh, uh, 2000 and so on. And those, some of those two guys went to Blockbuster and asked for some funding and they said, no, we want to buy it out. And uh, Netflix took very good decision and they said, Ki, let's uh, be in the race. And today, I think OTT and Netflix has become one of those platforms and COVID has really helped uh, to uh, boost at least in Indian uh, ecosystem. I had did one project, Video On Demand, back in 2000 uh, uh, during engineering and my professor said it will not work. But I think these guys have really made it wrong. But now how blockchain may prove Netflix wrong if they really do not adapt it. So what's your view, my dear friend Tejas, how Netflix looks at uh, decentralization of uh, media and entertainment industry? I could see at least 10 plus startups in India who are giving that opportunity for uh, content creators, media creators, and uh, take those royalties on the spot rather than wait for many more days or there are a lot of disputes around that. So yeah, over Tejas, over to you. First of all, thank you so much for, you know, inviting me here with a group of esteemed people here. Um, I'm very appreciative of this opportunity to speak here. Um, and uh, with regards to Netflix, right? Uh, today, as it stands, Netflix is not exploring the blockchain at this point. But that does not mean that it will not in the future. And there are many ways in which uh, there could be opportunities for Netflix. First and foremost, when it comes to uh, expenditure, content creation, takes up 80% of our expenses. We spend so much money on creating content. Uh, I think therein lies an opportunity to democratize that part, which is think of every movie release as an IPO. People participate and buy tokens for a movie while it is being shot. And then when the movie releases, it's people can exchange tokens, people can exchange tokens for some props of the movie. They can also get digital uh, memory libya from the movies themselves now extend this concept forward to the metaverse you can have digital equivalents of physical assets that exist in the metaverse and these nfts could be owned by netflix and can later be shared by, with people in fact when we released our, our show stranger things we actually had nfts that were uh, given out to some uh, folks that were interested in buying them we gave it for free but we just wanted to create a buzz for it. Um, so that's one aspect in which we are focusing. The other one, which is creator uh, content. Uh, I think we realize that for now, our focus is on content that we create and gaming that can rely on the IP of the content. Uh, TikTok and YouTube shorts are a very close competitor of ours and they rely on a lot on the creator content. So that is another aspect of uh, the blockchain ecosystem that we may explore in the future. But at this point, I think the first step would be to democratize the movie making process itself. Yeah, thank you so much. I think what we have seen Netflix and there are other uh, ecosystems also looking forward how tomorrow's interfaces are going to change. It's not only mobility. Mobility will prevail for longer period, but I think immersive experiences backed by AR, VR is going to be the future. I think in that ecosystem also blockchain will prevail because it will bring on a uh, right set of a security backed by identity. We keep hearing uh, self sovereign identity and so on. Uh, Ravi, I think uh, uh, your journey is uh, phenomenal so far last uh, decade or so. You have seen how companies are going down and you have experience to make them up, right? And now having that uh, right company spearheading for uh, communication, spearheading for uh, telecom industry, now you have moved on and started a, such a great initiative out there. So how was your experience of adopting blockchains? You have seen large scale use case adoption in banking side, but there is another sector, telecoms, right? They have also done some kind of use case. Can you just uh, throw some light on that? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, uh, before I uh, started this uh, venture studio, I spent 12 years at Gupshop, which is very well known in India, and we, um, the, you know, my co-founder ran the consumer side and I ran the enterprise side and grew that from zero to 2,000 crores, sending about 9 billion messages. But as we evolved through the journey, we, I mean, we've done multiple things like using AI and, and you know, uh, for chat and, and stuff like that, and, and um, bots and stuff like the chat bots. But the most important thing that I thought that really opened my eyes is this use case is kept secret. Nobody even knows about it, right? I think Tech Mahindra won an award for um, helping uh, Geo implement that part of the DLT. But what was good about this is uh, the key uh, messaging service providers like Gupshep and Tanla own about 70% uh, of the market share. Uh, and uh, people like Tech Mahindra working with Geo and uh, us working with some other operators and Tri. Uh, created kind of a DAO, right? It's like a telco DAO, they're the government, the regulator, the messaging service, key messaging service providers uh, to fight spam. Because the thing is, every time we'd come and they'd say, okay, you know, we didn't do it, we didn't do it. The major guys would say, we didn't do it. Airtel would say, no, Geo would pay sooner. Then who did it? Then it'll be some uh, person who's kind of pre-forwarding it, some reseller, then they'll say, no, we didn't. How do we track this, right? So today, the, and this, the government started this initiative in 2018. It was mandated as a law in 2020. Everybody had to implement it, otherwise uh, your A to B message. So A to B message is something when your flight gets delayed, your banking transaction, all that comes, right? So the 40 billion messages that are sent every month, and every message, the DLT fee is 2.5 paise. Yes. So think about the revenue, right? It is, it is like 10,000, you know. And that uh, is non-negotiable. You yeah, can always negotiate the best Any, your cost. Messaging price can change, but DLTP is non-negotiable. So you're thinking about use cases, and this is a $12 billion use case, right? Oh, sorry, $18 billion use case, $1.5 billion per month, uh, 10,000 crores, right? So that's kind of the scale. So it's an $18 billion use case that's been going on since 2020, and nobody even knows about it. But we were, you know, the it's like, so that brings me to the thing that, Blockchain can be done. There were a lot of uh, initial issues. We started off slowly in 2020. Then now it's like a, a default thing where everybody, every message has to go through that, especially if it goes through the major telcos and the operators. And, and major telcos are the ones that enable all the messages. So if Airtel and Voda and Geo want to do it and Tata, nobody else can bypass that. So that the use case here is DAO. Think about it. You start an LLC. You start a website. Those days when, uh, 1995, when Netscape came saying starting a website is such a problem, how do I do that? But today, you can create message-based templates. There'll be a telco DAO, there'll be a customer service DAO, because now if I have to start it, you have to go do consulting with the blockchain person, what do I do it? You do multiple peoples. But if enterprise, if companies were able to create a customer service DAO, you create a community and say, okay, I want to get a more decentralized, more authentic approach to what's happening, where the customers have a voice on which product works, which product doesn't work, what's really there. You'll get an authentic information about product quality, customer service, and everything. So that's one example, right? Then you can use a lot of uh, those things. So I think those are some of the new technologies that are interesting. And how do you also integrate AI with uh, blockchain? That's a big thing. Because AI is a centralized thing. If you do need to do real good AI, you need to run uh, you know, these super uh, GPU type things, whereas blockchain is decentralized and you can't have centralized compute capability, so how do you marry these two things? But the applications are very immense if you can able to marry them together because the biggest thing, the flaw in, in blockchain or any of the Web3 is within the on-chain, everything is fine, but everything cannot be done on-chain. And so you have to get information or some validation from off-chain. When you do that, if the information is spurious or people collude, super nodes collude, then they contaminate the information, then the whole smart contract is not valid. Because smart contract is just not as smart because it's just a set of rules that you take and put it in digitally. So if you can use AI for anomaly detection, right, and you do the GPU like a GAN off chain and have that feed the node, and then you come and then smart contract governs itself by going to these off chain things, and then you make the off chain input also kind of generative and you know, automated and adaptive. Now it's not adaptive, smart contracts not adaptive. That's those are great uses. So I think the evolution is just starting, just like when Web2 uh, started with websites, people didn't know, but I think using these DAO type templates for different use cases could be huge, and I think we're just getting started. That's one of the reasons why a kind of, uh, you know, generative AI and Web3 is an area of focus for us, and we think it's going to be huge, and it's going to be done a lot in countries like India, because India and US will be the forefront of this thing.
Yeah, wonderful insights, Ravi. I think uh, that makes understand that e blockchain is not the solution. It has to work cohesively with the other technologies, so-called AI, or recently we are talking around generative AI. I think media plays a major role to make people understand something new is coming, right? You spoke about cloud or edge computing. There are many technologies has to work cohesively so that we take these use cases in front of uh, customers. So Varun, I think uh, uh, blockchain is hardest to sell. It's not something like if you come to me and uh, Hitesh will say, yeah, let's go ahead with that uh, use case because this is going to be very future. Because we keep hearing blockchain is a future, internet 2.0 results or trust. But when you talk, uh, when you come down to the actual use cases, how to really make it understand the existing ecosystem, Ex existing infrastructure, so-called core banking and many more APIs and so on. So how is your journey so far? I have seen Wipro's from initial days of adoption of creation of those practices in a, in a blockchain. Uh, I think uh, phenomenal journey. Uh, yeah, Varun. Thank you, Prasanna. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Varun. I head the blockchain for Lab 45 at Wipro. Uh, to, to answer your point, Prasanna, I think today our conversations with customers are not around POCs and pilots, right? I think customers uh, have understood to a very large extent, and I'm talking globally, have understood the value of blockchain, right? And uh, most of our conversations today are happening with business, yeah. chief business officers and so on, right? Uh, I'll, I'll take a couple of examples to show uh, the level of maturity large organizations have achieved uh, in blockchain. For example, we are working with a large oil and gas company in Europe. It's a global oil and gas company which is setting up an uh, uh, ecosystem of suppliers and uh, service technicians and oil and gas companies to give end-to-end -end asset lifecycle visibility of high-value devices. So, for example, you have these pipelines through which crude flows from one place to other place and the valves that control the flow of the crude uh, are extremely critical. If the valve goes down, it's, a, its losses goes into millions, right? And these valves are extremely expensive. So it's, it's hard to maintain inventory of these devices. How you can uh, give the entire ecosystem the visibility of what is the state of your valve so that the suppliers, the manufacturers, the technicians, all of them get real-time visibility and they all pitch in to maintain the inventory real-time, right? That is a big thing. It's not very natural for the top two players or competitors in an industry to come together to collaborate. So you have to really solve industry-level problems, right? Uh, where, uh, for example, uh, another one which I would quote is Pharma Ledger, where 16 top pharmaceutical companies have come together to solve some basic industry level problems like electronic product catalog. And then um, coming back to the challenges that you were talking about, I think the strength of the blockchain itself is sort of the bottleneck because blockchain thrives on ecosystem, right? And it's not very natural for large organizations to sort of come together with their competitors without losing control, right? So the governance of the, of the consortium, building that trust that, yes, I'm not here to build my IP, right? It's not my IP. It's for the industry and, and solving the problem, right? That is the approach that takes quite amount of time for people to understand on the top, right? And, and, and that is one of the biggest ones. The one that is going to emerge very soon is that increasingly these large organizations are committing to sustainability and the technologies that are sustainable. We need to figure out how blockchain will do that because for storing each byte of data on blockchain, you actually multiply that with the number of nodes, right? So it's not very sustainable uh, from that perspective. So that is something, a lot of research is going on in the industry. We are collaborating with academia to see how we can solve these problems. But yes, that those are wide spaces that need to be looked into uh, uh, there. Uh, another uh, example I would give uh, is, is of our own platform, which is Dice ID, uh, which is a decentralized identity. I think uh, Priya spoke about it. But we are more focused on verifiable credentials. So what we are trying to do here in India is to work with the government and the ed tech companies, the startups, the recruiters, and the employers like Wipro to create an ecosystem for skill credentials. Again, the problem that we are trying to solve is very aligned to the Skill India mission from our government. 
right? There is a problem of skill standardization. There's a problem of skill recognition. And then there is this whole concept of skill credit bank, which is missing today in India. It's available in US and other countries where you could pick and choose courses from one course and then add up your credits to say that you are a bachelor's degree, right? Those kind of things are problems that are waiting to be solved. The good news is blockchain can really solve huge industry level problems and our customers and all of us are working towards that. I think, uh, good, I think uh, uh, what I understood so far post our discussions, I think uh, mindset problem, having right governance, EBIC is one example who can solve that governance problem or ownership of data among all the all the bank, that could be the one uh, uh, model for other industries or other construction to, to follow, right? Uh, while uh, doing any of these developments of a blockchain, as you rightly said, ROI, how do I calculate ROI, right? And when I go back in uh, 1718s and let's say, uh, Sankar, let's do something on Hyperledger or something on Ethereum. And apart from selling blockchain, you have to sell blockchain infrastructure also, right? And it takes a lot of time to build those use cases. And I have seen my early days of a career, right? When you used to write uh, Hello World in every language, Java or everywhere. And then we moved on to rapid application development platforms, which has really helped drag drop and create those whole uh, ecosystems. I think blockchain also evolved. Blockchain as a service model. Uh, there are a lot of platforms available in the industry where you just have to say which are all the stakeholders, what is the workflow all about, which platform to choose, whether Ethereum, Hyperledger, so on. And that is what I have seen the journey of Zeev, right, backed by Dr. Chamriya. So Sankalp, how you have seen and what is the power of this Web3 infrastructure while uh, governance, uh, corporates, and a lot of use cases or a uh, lot of startups are coming up, how infrastructure plays a major role for enterprise blockchain adoption? Hello. Yeah, so uh, let me start with something positive to add uh, to this conversation. Um, so we've been working in this, in this enterprise space for quite some time, about six, seven years, catering to the needs of different domains. And what I would say that is that uh, being on the infrastructure side, we get to see all the insights from our customers of what they're doing, what kind of work are they into. So I can uh, tell you this much to you folks that a lot of blockchains have gone in production, a lot of projects have gone in production around the globe. And there is some amazing work that is, has taken on the ground and even the customers don't realize that they're actually functioning on blockchain, but actual business is operating in such ways. Uh, there are a lot of uh, use cases that have hit on ground in Europe. Uh, there's energy web, so green initiatives have come forward because of blockchain. Uh, there is uh, consortium that have formed for IoT purposes. So really fascinating because some of the use cases we, we, that we thought would be the dif most difficult ones to start off with, they're the ones who have actually gone in production. Now we have a big ecosystem of EV vehicles and uh, IoT uh, platforms integrating together to provide seamless transactions for whatever you do uh, for home automation or your e-vehicle charging and whatever uh, you know, purpose you would uh, drive your automation for. And similarly, we've seen trade finance picking up quite well, uh, how to change that around time for your letter of credits and such. So we see all these use cases uh, turning around. India is uh, a little bit slow, I'd say, in that uh, segment. We still have to change our mindset, I guess, but I think we are getting there. Uh, it's the startups that is our power, and uh, uh, what we are trying to do is just provide the ecosystem uh, on infrastructure side. So the tools, the technologies that were missing out there, uh, you know, six, seven years back, we came up with it, and we thought, you know, whether it's enterprise or whether it's uh, a small-time, medium-sized company, they can benefit from this. So now we're coming about to, because it took us decades to master Web2. That's why we had these, all these clouds. Uh, from infrastructure side perspective at least, right? So, uh, of course, it will take time for Web3 to also uh, become that cheap, that efficient, but uh, that's what we're trying to do. I, I think we're getting there real quick. So, yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, that's what I just carry some outputs around this. Uh, the challenges around development is resolved. Uh, we keep talking about the scalability or uh, security, but for sure it's the ecosystem play. So when we always come into the ecosystem, we'll always look at how multiple factors we can validate, test, and move ahead.